Good afternoon. I'm so excited that uh, we have the opportunity at MDIC to have a discussion with Acting Commissioner Janet Woodcock today. And this has always been an important part of the tradition for MDIC's annual public forum to have a discussion with the commissioner. And so at first I'd like to ask you a little bit about your background so that the community can get to know you from a more personal point of view instead of just your official role. And so I know that uh, you studied chem chemistry as an undergraduate and then went on to medical school. And so did you always know that you wanted to pursue a career in medicine? How did that happen? It happened really accidentally. I mean, I was interested in biochemistry. I went to college, majored in chemistry, but took a minor in biology. Uh, and then I went and worked as an analytical chemist in industry for a while. I found that extremely trying. And so a friend of mine suggested I go to medical school because he was going to medical school. And so I applied and uh, that's how I ended up becoming a physician. I really hadn't considered it before then. Well, and you've had such a distinguished career with FDA. You've um, seen a lot of other folks come and go from FDA. Can you tell us about some of the highlights of your experience uh, at FDA, some of your major milestones? Sure. Well, when I started, I started in the Biologic Center. And so that was at a time when the biotech revolution was really getting underway and there was really a lot going on. And so I was at a hand in forming the Office of Therapeutics. The Office of Therapeutics uh, approved uh, many of the new biotech products. Eventually, it transferred over to CEDAR, uh, so therapeutics would all be together. But that was something uh, that was important to do. And I learned a great deal when I worked at CEDAR, including about vaccines, which I think is standing me in good stead now. Um, when I went to CEDAR, I had to spend a lot of time on organization. We had to implement the user fee programs. We had to get the place sort of organized and structured. I built the first um, adverse event reporting system. The other, the previous one was microfiche and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> Excel spreadsheet or some kind of primitive spreadsheet. Um, then, um, you know, I worked on a uh, concept of risk management because people are always talking about safety. And of course, no drug is really safe or, you know, most products aren't wholly safe. It's a benefit risk analysis. So worked on that. I went over to the commissioner's office for a while and did the critical path initiative there, which was the development of tools, evaluative tools and better pathways for development and evaluation of medical products. That was very rewarding. Also started the Sentinel system when I was there, which is now very large and of course uses electronic um, it uses claims data and electronic health records to track uh, adverse events of drugs and so forth. Um, when I came back to the center, I did a lot of different things. I um, started patient-focused drug development. And of course, patient focus for medical products has become a really important concept and idea. But I started that within the um, user fee negotiations. We got some money to do patient-focused drug development under Padoof, one of the PADUFAs. That was important. And all this time, we're continuing to negotiate user fee programs and continuing to try and, um, you know, improve uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of the review process and the post-market safety evaluation and so forth. And then, um, you know, I've been involved in many other types of initiatives like that, uh, over the last year, I worked at Operation Warp Speed, and I was in charge of overseeing the development of the therapeutics for COVID-19. And so that was a different and difficult <laughs> experience. But again, I learned some things. And since uh, January 20th, I've been doing work as the acting commissioner, trying to get make sure the FDA stays on an even keel, and we continue to make progress and everything as we 
continue to deal with the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, what an amazing uh, series of brilliant activities over the years. And so as you know, the Medical Device Innovation Consortium really focuses on what is cutting edge, what is innovative, and certainly we have a whole history of <laughs> very innovation focused. And so what is it that makes you innovation focused and what are among those many accomplishments that you've made got you most excited about innovation? Well, you know, some of the things that I, I also worked on, the, once the uh, human genome was sequenced, we began to get a lot of genomic uh, information generated by companies about their drugs, but they were afraid to send it into FDA. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe this now, but this was 20 years ago. And they said we'd be, do stupid things, ask them stupid questions and so forth. So we did the voluntary genomic data submission process, okay, uh, which was very innovative to bring in genomic data without any regulatory penalties. So people could, without fear, submit their genomic data to the FDA. And looking back, that's all history. I mean, all the, everything has genomic data with it now. We would be surprised, uh, eyebrows would probably be raised if you didn't have genomic data about your therapy. So that was a very successful project. I think the um, biomarker qualification process and drug development tools qualification process that I started had a much rockier history <laughs> um, because it turns out that, you know, qualification of tools, say for safety or new tools for effectiveness, you know, they have a lot of weight to them. There's a lot of importance to those decisions. And so it's harder than people think. People can't just find a biomarker in a lab and say, oh, now I found, you know, a good way to monitor kidney disease. It just doesn't work that way, as I think the device consortium knows very well. But a lot of people were very shocked by that. And we had a long and torturous history about this. But in 21st century cures, uh, you know, I had a hand in negotiating a lot of that uh, with the Hill. And we got a new um, pay authority, the Cures Pay Authority, that's helping the device center as well as the drugs and biologics. Uh, to hire the qualified people we need. We got uh, other authorities like Breakthrough, the Breakthrough Authority and um, Designation, and um, we got a, this pathway for qualification. And so that has settled down, I think, and people are beginning to understand. I know Devices has a very similar, Center for Devices has a very similar um, process where they're trying to develop, for example, in Devices, uh, simulations of the human body so you can you know, model a clinical trial and not actually have to do the clinical trial. And of course, there's interest in doing that for animals as well and so forth. So, you know, there have been a lot of things that I felt uh, very good about in innovation, advancing uh, innovative science. Yeah, and you talk about gene therapy and certainly um, during this time of COVID, all the research in gene therapy has made a big difference in mm -hmm. advancing so many things. And I will ask you a few COVID related questions, but before I do that, having spent uh, the bulk of your time at FDA focused on pharma, um, how do you view the world of devices? Considering that the audience for today's event is the <laughs> device community, what is your perspective on devices? And um, you've pointed out some areas of potential overlap and potential collaboration. What, how are you looking at the device community and uh, what the potential is for devices? Well, first of all, let's start with diagnostics, which are a special kind of um, device. Uh, diagnosis is a foundation of medicine. And I feel like in the United States, often we rush to treatment and we uh, ignore the diagnostics. They're probably the most important part of, of any uh, workup of a patient or whatever is that diagnostic. And of course, we have many more companion diagnostics now as we're beginning to understand um, in cancer, for example, target status and, and so forth and so on. Um, 
And so I think device uh, diagnostic uh, products are going to be increasingly important over the years and, and really hopefully really be a foundation for medicine. On the other side, some of the interventional devices, some of the other devices, I mean, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing world out there. The devices are so broad, they have, they range through so much scope. Um, one of the ones I'm so interested in is the new digital health world. And the fact that um, really uh, some of the studies I've seen, you know, a counselor, a therapist, uh, people could can interact uh, with uh, their um, a software program and really help with behavioral health issues in, in ways that are just as effective as seeing another human. And certainly during the time of COVID, that's been a really important um, adjunct to have. And of course, many of the other diagnostics, the invasive ones, are, are, I mean, uh, devices, the invasive devices are just incredible in what can be done by interventional radiologists and others. So I feel the future is really bright, but we're gonna see a fusion um, between devices and drugs and biologics where we're gonna see products that can't be easily categorized at all into one of those categories, but are really new kinds of, of products. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you mentioned digital health because we're doing a deeper and deeper dive mm -hmm. in that arena. And it's clear with software as a device or connected mm -hmm. devices, um, it's really making a difference in how we define this part of our world. And as you mentioned, diagnostics is another big area for MDIC and, um, and that whole environment is changing in part because of one of the things you mentioned earlier, which is gene therapy. So um, I want to take a minute and really compliment you for your leadership with Operation Warp Speed. It's the last year and a half has been transformative for all of us but especially at FDA and how FDA has managed the needs of our whole country during this time. And I was hoping that you could share a little bit about the fact that FDA has had its usual requirements and needs and expectations, and then this whole additional layer on top of it. So. How, how have you been able to be successful with all of that on your plate? You know, I'm not sure. I'm sure we were successful, but I'm not sure how we did it. One of the things, there was an employee viewpoint survey. It's done every year by the Office of Personnel Management across the government, and, and it was done in November. And, you know, I looked over the results carefully because I expected them to be really plummeting. And instead, people's morale was up because our people are public health people, okay? And so this was an opportunity to step up to a crisis and really make a difference. And many, many people stepped up and worked day and night for, for a very long period of time in order to meet the need. And they felt good about it. So, um, you know, I think there are pockets where the overwork has led to burnout and we have to be concerned about that and we have to do what we can to help those people. But overall, I think the morale is pretty good. And in fact, yes, CEDAR managed to approve the usual number of new molecular entities. Uh, CDRH approved its usual number of devices and, um, and so forth. Uh, even in the face of this onslaught, I think CDRH had like 600 EUAs or something like that, some really incredible number. And some of those were like blanket type of EUAs. So um, somehow FDA managed, but I don't think people should imagine that, okay, well, they did that. They can keep do that for the next five years and just double their work. Uh, people are tired. Uh, we issued our inspection report recently and it showed, you know, we there, one thing we didn't do was a lot of surveillance inspections because it was too dangerous. Even now, for example, we can't get into India and some other countries, and you know we don't know when we would be able to get back in. So there are some things that we're going to have to uh, be catching up on that we were not able to accomplish during during the worst parts of the pandemic, and uh, also, yeah, people are going to have to deal with some exhaustion and burnout. 
but we have learned new ways and I'm sure that's true everywhere. We've learned new ways of working, uh, efficient ways, you know, um, working together remotely and virtually, we're able to accomplish a great deal. Um, we don't have to commute <laughs> or maybe even dress up sometimes, <laughs> stay in our jammies if we don't turn on our video. <laughs> and, um, you know, people have been very productive, most people. Of course, those who have small children, um, that's a real challenge if you're all home together, but hopefully things will, um, uh, you know, become more normal. But I think there's going to be a new normal. It's not going to be how we uh, operated before this. Yeah. Yeah. No, one of the examples that comes to my mind is uh, just before COVID came to the United States, um, we put together a global conference on EUAs. And at the time, people in our industry knew about emergency youth authorization, but now it's a household term. And how <laughs> remarkable that it isn't just people in our industries that are knowledgeable about emergency use and yeah. how that can be used in a crisis. And now the whole country and, and mm -hmm. the whole world is aware of the difference that can be made using that as a tool. Mm -hmm. But if I can switch gears a little bit, I know that you have testified before Congress at least 50 times and so many things that you've done in your career led you to your current acting commissioner role. But what do you think of the things that you've done over time really help best prepare you for what you're doing right now? You know, I often say that I think almost everything I've ever done in my life has prepared me for the next phase. Even the work I did in Warp Speed over the last year, I got to know the people at HHS better, uh, some of the career staff and so forth. Um, I had a couple stints in the commissioner's office before, and so I have strong opinions about management and organization. <laughs> and so that I was helpful. That was back in 2005, 2007 in that period. Um, but, you know, I got myself involved in budgets and so forth then. Of course, I've worked closely with CDRH over the years as well. I've been in CBER. The places I've had to learn the most about are, is our foods program uh, since I've taken over this job. Um, so, um, you know, I think every step of my career, I've been able to learn new things. It's, that's one of the nice things I like. That's why I'm still here. Because <laughs> if it had been very static, I would be somewhere else. <laughs> but there are always different new challenges and different things to learn. As you said, the technology is changing all the time. And I like to keep up with the science. I enjoy the science. So um, I think all of those things have helped me. Um, prepare for this role, but I've had to have a fair amount of briefings on, on the foods program. Yeah. So the Medical Device Innovation Consortium was really founded on the importance of regulatory science and, and, and I'll underscore the word science and how it is applied to innovation and how it can foster innovation. And mm -hmm. I'd love to get your perspective on how how those two different pieces, regulatory science and innovation, can play together. Well, you're singing my song because that was really the theme of the Critical Path Initiative, which is, you know, we can't keep using the same old tools from the 70s to evaluate technology of the, at that time, you know, the 2000s. So um, the evaluative tools, the way we evaluate products has to evolve along with the, the as the science evolves that's generating those products and the understanding about disease too at the same time in material science and everything else that evolves over time so and now computer science frankly uh, we're going to have to bring that in right and make sure we're up to date on that so um, I think innovation is held back and stifled when we don't have up-to-date uh, regulatory science, where we don't have up-to-date tools that match the science of the innovation. So if we're trying to evaluate uh, new science with old science, 
then we get that's when we get into trouble. And that's really, I think, what the industry was telling me in 2000 when they wrote me a letter saying, we're not going to send you any genomic data because you'll ask us stupid questions. <laughs> so we need, I mean, there's thoughts now that we should have some kind of um, no fault, you know, system, uh, a, uh, you know, a safe harbor type of thing, perhaps for some of the alternative, new alternative methods that people might use for evaluating safety, for example, microphysiologic systems, organs on a chip, all this kind of stuff. And that may well be the case because we do have to, if, if you're going to innovate rapidly, you have to innovate rapidly in regulation too. Otherwise you're using the older tools and against the newer science, and there will always be kind of a mismatch there. Which is the perfect segue to my next question, because as more and more people get vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, most of us are hopeful for a return to what could be normal, whatever normal might look like in the future. And how will that return to normal manifest itself with FDA? Well, we're going to have to be like in lockstep with whatever the federal government um, does. We have um, successfully brought our people back to the laboratories. One of the first things I did on January 20th, one of the first things I did was begin a campaign to get our people vaccinated as quickly as possible, especially our investigators, okay, because we were holding back product approvals and so forth because we couldn't go out and do the inspections. So... I think um, uh, the FDA will look different. We won't be so, we've always had terrible trouble with our footprint in recent years because we've gained staff and we haven't gained space. And I think we'll be able to manage our footprint a lot better with much more remote work and, and different things like that. So I think that will be different. I think um, while I'm here at least, um, I'm going to put a huge emphasis, and I will, I'm working with CDRH on this and CBER and others, on the modernization plans for the technology and data um, to develop enterprise-wide systems rather than the fragmented legacy uh, IT systems that we have and data that doesn't talk to each other, that's siloed and so forth because I think that will drive huge efficiencies and better understanding across all the different product centers. So I think that will be a difference because we're going to do a shift to enterprise rather than, you know, local option, um, very expensive <laughs> and often get obsolete very fast <laughs> computer systems. Um, but really, I think a lot of what FDA does is driven by the innovation in the industry, right? And so the industry comes up with new ways, or it may be by the societal or patient needs. And both of those intersect, and both of those we work with. So industry is reacting to medical needs and developing innovation and new products. Patients and and the public in different ways are having a pull a function. They're saying, we want this, we want that. And FDA is there in between. How do we make sure that whatever is delivered meets the need, but doesn't cause some other kind of problem, right? So um, I think um, advancing uh, science will be very important, but the science is going to look a little bit different. It's going to be very data heavy, very computer intensive in the future because we're talking about very large data sets, very large amounts of information and so on. So real world evidence is a critical piece of who MDIC is and will become. Um, certainly our national evaluation system for health technology, NEST, um, yes. is one area where we're really trying to drive the use of real world data and real world evidence as well as our diagnostics area and our health economics and patient value are all areas where we at MDIC are pushing the importance of real world data and real world evidence as it can be applied to uh, clinical trials and how it can be applied to active surveillance, 
and ultimately to coverage and payment, which I recognize is not under your auspices, but how are you seeing real world evidence and how it has the potential to be transformative? Well, uh, we've been working on it for quite some time. We had congressional instructions to work on it, in fact. And um, during the uh, pandemic, we had the um, evidence accelerator that we did with the Reagan Udall Foundation. And I think that's been very useful and has generated more information. Um, CEDAR is working on, uh, has done a number of real world evidence trials in parallel to uh, actual randomized clinical trials and to see what, we, of course, we don't know which one is actually going to be right when we get the answer, but it is um, useful information. So, and then of course, in the safety world, we've always used real world evidence um, because that's what, that's what we have uh, out in the post-marketing area. So I think it's going to be an evolution. Um, I don't think it's going to be like a, you know, a revolution, a step function where all of a sudden we have all this information because there's really a lot of problems. I, I was really sad to see Amy Abernathy leave. And, um, As were we. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I had some long talks with her before uh, she left, but clearly there, there are problems out there with getting the data together the way the data exists in the, in the health records and we all have to overcome that. None of these are insuperable problems though. I think they all can be resolved and the future is very bright, but it's just gonna take a little bit longer than some of the enthusiasts may have thought. Well, and I applaud um, you championing this and uh, certainly among the things that we're focused on are the quality of the data and the methods of collecting yeah. data because uh, good data in, good data out, and we right. want to continue to foster that. Um, one of the things that you talked about a few minutes ago was about the patient and whether it's patient-generated data or patient-reported outcomes or electronic health records. We all need to keep patients at the center of everything that we do, and mm -hmm. your team speaks to that and my team speaks to that, but what can we continue to do, um, especially during this challenging time when we've seen more challenges for patients than ever before? How do we continue to make sure that the patients are at the center of the conversation and we get their input on the solutions that we create? Well, I think uh, PCORI and with Full disclosure, I'm in the board of PCORI, uh, although I haven't been able to go to too many meetings lately, but they've really worked on the science of patient engagement and engaging patients all the way through. Of course, their arc is doing trials and the industry arc is designing products. So, you know, what I've heard from patients is you need to involve us from the very get-go of the design. So what is your target? product profile if you're a patient, not if you're trying to, you know, sell the product or reimburse for the product or regulate the product. If you're a patient, what matters to you and what's important? And I think um, we've often been surprised uh, that the preconceptions, don't forget, I'm, you know, I'm a physician. And when I was trained, it, the doctor knew best. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> It really didn't matter what the patient thought. <laughs> and even when I came to FDA I, and to CEDAR, I objected to some of the measures they're using. They were using for symptomatic diseases, they were using a physician global. And I said, well, it really doesn't matter how the physician feels. <laughs> it's how the patient feels, <laughs> right? That's how. So um, we really have to ask, and you know, CEDAR has been holding these patient focused drug development meetings, even on difficult topics like autism and um, um, substance use disorders. And you learn really very interesting things from the patients that some of the folks with autism said, you know, they're developing a lot of uh, therapeutics to decrease stimming, which are repetitive behaviors. And they say, we do those to calm ourselves and we don't want 
to decrease that. We want therapies that will help us communicate better with other people, right? That's really what is, we're most interested in. So sometimes I think you can go off on the wrong tangent if you don't really have the patient at the center. And we've learned from trials that sometimes trials are designed and, you know, you think what were the people thinking? They would have a, like a four-year-old child and they would have to spend a day at the hospital going through all these tests and evaluations and, you know, did you ever interact with the toddler? You know, <laughs> this is really not possible. So um, I think um, there are tremendous opportunities and I think we are part way there, but like with things like wearables, videos, uh, electronic, all kinds of ways of getting people's input and how they're feeling both during a trial or when they have a disease. It's going to help us tremendously in helping people ma manage their disease the way they want to. Well, and I think this is a great place for us to wrap up because the center of everything that we do is the patient. And so to close in with embracing that is so important to what you do, to what we do at MDIC. Our uh, science of patient input work is very central to who we are and what we do and keeping the patient voice and making sure that devices aren't developed without the patient voice, diagnostics and all of our work to make sure that we understand what's important to the patient and not just presume what's important to them. So thank you so much for taking the time today to join the Medical Device Innovation Consortium community. It's mm -hmm. been really great to talk to you and I have followed your leadership for years and it's great that the Medical Device Innovation Consortium community can get to hear that important voice and look forward to finding ways that, um, that the device community and the drug community can find ways to work together and to challenge each other and, and be successful together. So thank you so much for the time today. It was great and great talking to you. Thank you much. Thank you.